Um, so, okay, a warm welcome to everyone this evening. Um, what is going to be our second event in a, in a four-part series um, from the Passive House Association of Ireland. So for, you, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm the current chair at the moment. Uh, and my name's Barry McCarran. Um, so really, I'm just going to kick off by providing a bit of an overview and a bit of a context to the Passive House Association of Ireland and what it is we do. Um, and, and then moving on into a bit of an overview on what tonight will consist of. Um, so the PHAI is, is 10 years old now, just, just gone past 10 years old. And we've been the body for that 10 years uh, in, in advocating a passive house on the island of Ireland and promoting the benefits of, of low carbon design through the, the principles of, of passive house uh, across the construction sector in Ireland. So uh, Passive House Design is, is the proven quality assured route to achieving NZEB and delivering low carbon buildings. This is against a, an increasing background uh, and context of, of a declared climate emergency on both sides of the border here on the island. Um, we've also got um, a fresh context emerging post um, COVID-19 in relation to the importance of ventilation in buildings. Um, we also then have the increasing ratcheting across the world of, of all standards towards really genuine low carbon buildings. So it's in that context that Passive House is beginning to thrive. Um, so it's really our mission to promote, educate and to facilitate um, the, the growing demand for the standard uh, on, on, in Ireland. So it's, it's, it's um, against that context that that we exist and events like this are, are put forward. So uh, the Pacifier Association of Ireland is also part of a wider global network in the form of, of an affiliate um, to the International Passive House Association. And again, like our event last week, um, you know, whether it be live or recorded, um, you know, we want to try and get uh, and cultivate a, a, a thing. If, if you like what you've seen between tonight and the other night, we, we sort of invite you to come along and maybe join the association. It's a very vibrant association and we're at the forefront of, of what's really happening in, in re with regards to low carbon buildings and high performance buildings uh, across the sector. So tonight builds, uh, as I said, on a very successful event um, two weeks ago in which fellow board member Tomas O'Leary outlined his personal journey, um, really, which was very inspiring from um, his first interaction and encountering of the Passive House Standard right through to building his own house and, and again, charting his journey right along um, to being a leader in his field. So, so really that's available on our website for, for watching. Um, it's, it's already got well over 100 views at this stage. So again, anybody that wasn't here last week, uh, I really invite you to go to our website and, and have a look at that um, uh, as well uh, as tonight's event as, as well. So really the program uh, or the format for tonight follows the same uh, as last week, really, we're going to have a, a guest speaker who I'll hand over to in a moment after I introduce them, followed by a very brief question and answers, and then something we're, that we're not maybe that familiar with in Ireland. Uh, we're going to we're going to be thrown into uh, breakout sessions, and I really encourage everybody to hang around for that. Uh, it's randomised, so we'll see who who we meet in the groups, and it's a really fun element of the event as well so, so that lasts for about for just seven minutes so so no real awkwardness uh, within that and and then we'll come back out for a little bit of a open mic session and a few announcements and then we'll, we'll wrap up within the hour okay so so for tonight it's it's a real pleasure for me in particular to introduce simon bell um who's a director or uh, a board member here with the phei as well uh, simon is a, a landscape architect by profession um, he is a director of HLM Architects and is based out of their Belfast office. Uh, and Simon tonight, very similar to Tomas in many ways, is going to ch chart his journey um, to the completion of his project, which is known as Knock by Barn. Um, I, again, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Simon. I think it was back in, in late 2018, but he can clarify that, uh, when he enrolled on, on the Passive House Designers course 
uh, at the Crest Building in Southwest College. Um, and it's really from there I've known him. And, and again, from a distance, uh, I, I've been sort of seeing his posts. Uh, he, uh, he, to me, is the, the first blogger that I encountered uh, within the Passive House arena that was really charting his project. So, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this with intrepidation, really, um, to, to, to see the project. So without further ado, I think I'll hand over to Simon and, and, and let the floor be his. So over to you, Simon. Um, okay. Thanks, Barry. Just get the uh, presentation on the screen. There we go. Um, so, yeah, as, as Barry said, uh, I just want to kind of take you through uh, the journey of uh, building our passive house, uh, which we've titled a, a combination of experts and newbies. Um, certainly when we started this, I was very much a newbie and I'm, I'm maybe slightly further along the line now, but uh, we've had the input of uh, lots of experts in, in passive house um, uh, along the way. Um, First of all, just kind of want to give a shout out to some of those team. Um, so my, my architect, a very good friend of mine, Ross Barrett at Studio B, um, who, who I've uh, worked with on some pacifiers many, many years ago as a landscape architect, actually doing the landscape for those uh, uh, pacifiers. And then uh, more, more recently, we're, we're working together. Uh, Ross is, is also part of HLM, and we're working on some really exciting pacifiers projects um, around the UK. Um, Design ID, our engineers. Um, Andy Lundberg at Passivate, who, who gave us some you know, really useful uh, initial uh, input before I kind of took on the uh, Passivate consultant uh, role. Um, and then uh, more recently, Bob Ryan, who's doing the certification. Um, the, the contractor, uh, McGarrell Developments. So, um, you know, Peter and his, his brother Joe and the team who, who had a little bit of Passivate ex experience, but not very much, but they, they really engaged in the project. Um, our air tightness uh, guru, Roman, from Clioma House, who I'm sure many of you will, will know, and uh, heat recovery from Paul Heat Recovery Scotland and uh, Daily Renewables doing the, the heat pump. So, you know, these are some of the experts that we were uh, relying on, but equally some of that team were, uh, were, were, were new to um, uh, Passive House. So uh, for us, the journey begun with the opportunity to purchase a fantastic site in, uh, in County Antrim uh, near Brasheen just on the edge of, uh, or the southern side of the, of the glens, um, three acres, two acres of agricultural land and an acre of uh, developable uh, land with um, you know, stunning views, but lots of uh, climate challenges with its, its height above sea level and all of those kinds of things. Um, so that was back in April, 2013. So a long time ago, so this, journey, this uh, project's uh, been uh, long in, in, in gestation. And I guess the question for, uh, for us, you know, why, why did we want to build? Uh, I think it, it was something that uh, uh, we've, we've had an aspiration for for a long time. Uh, we, we wanted to live in, in that rural setting. You know, we've lived in London, we've, we've lived in the sea. Uh, we, we wanted to uh, uh, move to a rural setting with space to kind of uh, be as self-sufficient as we possibly could. So there's, there's a, a huge aspiration to grow our own food. Uh, we wanted to live in a quality building, uh, which was comfortable and healthy. Um, and looking for somewhere to live for the rest of our, 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 our lives, really. Um, and also thinking ahead to future running costs um, and, you know, keen to make a difference. As, as Barry said, my background's in, in landscape architecture, where we're inherently uh, sustainability focused and environmentally focused. Um, and, you know, I think uh, this was an opportunity to you know, you know, deliver, deliver on that. And then why, why Passive House? So as I say, my, I think my first introduction to Passive House was probably back in, in 2010 when we uh, worked on some uh, uh, dwellings for the uh, Scottish Housing Expo. Um, and then we, uh, off the back of that, we did a, a, another uh, house up in the Highlands in, in, in Olapool. Um, so that, that, that was the first experience and I got to you know, see what the guys were doing and uh, the results that they were getting. Um, I really like that it's based on science um, and, you know, PHPP, uh, I love a good spreadsheet. Um, it's a fabric first approach, so it's simple. Um, I think we've seen lots of uh, green building approaches which rely on technology and complication and systems. And, uh, you know, I just wasn't, wasn't really up for that, um, wanted something that was simple. Um, but there's a clear path to delivering uh, or, or achieving that, that standard. Um, and the evidence is there that it's, uh, it performs consistently. And I think, you know, we, we all know about the performance gap with, uh, with so many of the, the buildings that are being built today. Um, but with the House, that's, a, that's eliminated. So that was really important. 
Um, and then there's an independent certification uh, process as well. Um, so it, it, it wasn't simply designing to a standard, but it was it was being independently uh, checked. And I think uh, particularly as a, as a new passive house consultant, that's hugely important to make sure that, uh, uh, that we're getting it right. Um, but equally, it wasn't overly prescriptive about how the criteria are met. And some people would say it is. And, and uh, I think our experience certainly is that, that it's not. You can be really creative. OK, it might not be the most cost effective way of doing it, but you can still be creative and, and uh, achieve, the, uh, achieve the standard. So some of the initial technical design drivers for us uh, at the time we started, so that was back in 20, 2013, there was relatively limited uh, passive house experience in, in Northern Ireland. There were probably a few architects, you know, really delivering um, and not that many contractors uh, in, that, in that space. So we, we needed to be aware of that. Uh, we wanted to, where possible, utilize typical traditional building techniques. Um, and use readily available materials and systems. Um, so trying not to be, I guess, the, the guinea pigs for, for, for new systems, even though um, you, you know my mindset would be to try new things, but really kind of conscious about how we would actually deliver it cost effectively. Um, the design needed to be robust to, to cope with a, a, an exposed site. Um, and initially there was a, a fairly tight budget, although that, that, that has, uh, has, has grown a little bit as, as all of these uh, self-build projects seem to, seem to do. So we, we eventually got onto site in 2014. Um, this is my uh, young lad Noah out uh, inspecting the, the, the trial pit. So uh, that's when we discovered there was rock not that far below the, uh, below the ground. Um, and you know, huge excitement back in June 2014 and the aspiration that we would uh, have the, the house built before uh, this young lad went to, went to school. Um, how, how wrong we were with all of the uh, things that happened uh, along the way. Um, but we get stuck in and in January 2015, we, uh, uh, we planted the woodland, uh, about 1200 trees. Um, and at that point, we, we you know, had a view that this might, uh, you know, might, might fuel, the, uh, fuel the house to, to some degree, but uh, really now it's, it's about carbon capture and, and, and trying to balance you know, some of the uh, other aspects of, of, of our lifestyle and uh, uh, contributing back to, um, back to the environment. And you know, we saw the woodland grow. Uh, we, we watched the woodland grow while the, the house uh, stood still, while we negotiated planning, uh, building control, tendering, uh, job, uh, uh, you know, work-related issues or financial issues, and, and all of these things. So the, the project took quite a long while to actually uh, uh, get to uh, get to site. Um, but the, I suppose, getting back to uh, getting back to the, the project, and of, of course, the first thing we're we're looking at is is orientation. So we were uh, really fortunate. The the house is on a, a south facing slope, um, so really good um, access to uh, the sun, um, but equally uh, very exposed from the the southwest and also uh, from from the east to to, to wind, um, and um, you, you know that was something we were uh, very conscious of. Um, and then we had these fantastic views. So there's a, a beautiful framed view of Slemish Mountain out to the uh, out to the uh, sort of uh, east southeast. Um, panoramic views uh, out to the west, and then if, if, as you get up and level, you have full panoramic views to the south. So you know already we're, we're wanting to make use of these uh, uh, views, and uh, at the same time, some of these things, as, as you will see, will be um you know challenges from a passive house point of view and uh you know so we'll talk through what, what we what we did to, to balance all of that out um so this was kind of some of the modeling that we did while we had lots of time getting through planning and all of that uh, sort of stuff at the time i was uh um you know moving our our landscape team into into the the bim 3d world and and so kind of uh, did that did that with their own project so this was the the project you can kind of see the woodland and then the uh, developable uh, house. It's, it's, it's received many names. Um, I think it's been locally called the boat. Uh, some people have referred to it as a coffin, which isn't quite so, uh, which isn't quite so good. Um, but certainly it's, it's, it's different, as you can see, and uh, has, has attracted a bit of, of attention. Uh, we we sat out, set out with an aspiration of, of a, a kind of a typical Scottish longhouse, and uh, we'd given our architect quite a detailed brief, and uh, we were just kind of struggling between us all to get the uh, adjacencies in the rooms to work the way we wanted to. Um, and Ross came along with a, a, a you know, the, a, a different proposal. And as soon as we saw it, we went, "Yeah, that's 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 what we'd really like to to build." Um, so uh, we went off on uh, on that journey. 
Um, so we, we finally got uh, planning approval, I think it was in uh, 2016, 2017, uh, we finally got planning approval. Um, it was really quite a challenge, just the, the form of the building, the style of the building. Um, and then bizarrely, uh, the planners actually wanted us to have more glazing uh, in the building. So we, we had to wheel out the, uh, the pacifist reports to uh, justify why we didn't need any more glazing. Um, and eventually that, that got us over the line. And I'm sure the sustainability credentials of the project uh, had, had some impact on us finally uh, achieving planning, but it, it, it certainly wasn't, it wasn't a straightforward process. Um, in terms of the plans then, so the, the, the house is, is really uh, arranged around two floors, the uh, living, dining, kitchen space, and, and indeed the snug, which can be opened and closed onto that space uh, on the uh, south southwest uh, kind of facing uh, facades, kitchen larder boot room all on the north side, and then you know guest room taking um, uh, opportunity of the of the view to to Slemish uh, on on the ground floor, um, and also thinking ahead to our older years when uh, you know climbing the stairs might get a little bit too much for us. Um, and then upstairs, uh, again, it's uh, our main bedroom, Noah's bedroom, uh, family bathroom. Uh, and then a spare room in our, our, our study. And um, at the time when these plans were drawn, we, we thought this is a, a, an overly generous uh, study, but um, certainly since we moved in here in November, it's, it's been uh, a, a great place to work uh, in, in isolation for the, the last number of months while we, uh, while we get through the pandemic. So, you know, I think um, something that's perhaps becoming uh, more important in, in dwellings everywhere is that uh, home working space. Um, so some pacify stats, just uh, I, was, I was just going through some of these, we, we probably didn't generate these at the time, but I was going through these uh, over the last couple of days. So, you know, orientation uh, south, so thumbs up, form factor is about 2.8, which is, uh, you know, pretty good. Uh, glazing to TFA ratio is 28%, which, uh, you know, is a bit on the high side, um, but that's kind of coming around from east and west, and again, uh, lots of Pacifice gurus on the call will be uh, will will be uh, will, will 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 be questioning that as well, and 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 with quite rightly so. We know east and west glazing is is challenging, and uh, you know that's where our views were. So we've we've worked with it, and uh, you know we're we're still working through the shading strategy to to get that to get that right at the moment, uh, which is uh, you know why we're why we're certifying probably later in the summer when we've when we've got that right. Um, and then, uh, but south, south glazing to wall ratio is 19%, so that was pretty good. Heating demand uh, at the moment is sitting about 13, so we're again just finalizing everything in the, in the, the PHPP with the as constructed information, but it's, it's sitting about 13 at the moment. Uh, PER 35, which feels low to me, but um, you know, that's, that's what it's saying, and, and overheating uh, about 3% uh, three, three at the moment. So gen generally, uh, pretty good, we, we felt. Um, so here we are in June 2018. Uh, we've got a really lovely vegetable plot uh, uh, developing, but uh, you can see the footprint of the house, but it's certainly very much uh, no house at this stage. And, uh, uh, you know, we were, we're probably uh, just ahead of, of, of doing the course, Barry, you were right, I think it was uh, late, late 2018 we, we, that I enrolled in the, on the course. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's you're really beginning to get excited now because the start date was close, but we still hadn't quite quite made it. Oh, there's a blank slide. There we go. Um, so we, we finally got onto site in May uh, 2019, and um, I'm just going to use some of those construction photos to take you through um, the construction. Um, so starting really with the uh, foundation, we, we went for a, I guess, pretty typical uh, strip foundation. We were, uh, I suppose, aware of the passive slab type approach and it, it was uh, an option uh, with the engineers, but they, you know, we, we ended up going, going for this at the time. Um, and then the, the rising walls were built in, in thermal, uh, uh, thermal block, quinolite thermal block, just to uh, minimize the, the thermal bridging through, uh, through those uh, find foundations. Um, and then that was infilled with 200 uh, mil of uh, uh, rigid insulation um, and uh, then uh, concrete floor on top, which would become our uh, finished floor. So we have a polished concrete floor um, poured on, on, on day one and uh, you can imagine the kind of difficulty of trying to protect that through uh, through everything that comes along afterwards. So might do that slightly differently if we did it again. But you know, right now it's giving us 
uh, a really decent element of uh, of thermal mass, just which which helps to to, to balance the uh, the temperatures as the the rest of the construction is um, is lightweight timber frame. Um, there is some steel in the building. Uh, the steel is uh, ended up being uh, larger than the initial designs due to, um, I, I guess, the timber frame company taking a different view to our, our engineering company, and that was uh, quite a challenge and caused us quite a, a bit of, of, of delay in the project um, at, the, at the start. Um, certainly something, if I was doing it again, I'll, I'll come to what we would do again differently in a minute, but that's certainly one aspect that uh, I would be uh, Really keen to design out at the at the early at the early stages. Um, as you can see, we had to go into you know lots of uh, effort to uh, uh, minimise the thermal bridging. So that's uh, got armadillo um, thermal brick uh, material at the at the columns, and also then at uh, there's there's a, a balcony uh, junction as well, um, and then making sure that those were all fully insulated around. And uh, you know I think the guys did a a pretty good job in, in, in doing that neatly and, and tidily. So what would we, what would we do differently? I, I think we probably would go for the insulated slab foundation system now. I think it's, it's more widely available uh, back then. It's, it was quite, quite new and certainly that was the case in, in Northern Ireland or certainly when we designed it. I think uh, when we went to tender, uh, we, we probably could have changed, but nobody really wants to, to change at that stage. Um, we'd certainly omit steel wherever possible and, and use timber throughout. And, and I think that had been an aspiration, but the, the budget kind of uh, uh, challenged that. And then uh, perhaps if we'd uh, really looked into what that meant at the time, uh, it, the cost difference wouldn't have been so, so great, um, but really minimizing the, the need for thermal brake materials. Um, and the other thing which we didn't do was was really kind of plump for a, a timber frame company. We we left it open in the tender, um, and I think that was something that caused us quite a bit of uh, uh, delay and, and and issues just getting the detailed design right uh, with the the timber frame company. Uh, so we'd certainly um, you know make sure that we'd got that uh, aspect of the project tendered separately and and then brought into the main contract. Um, so yeah, timber frame. It's a fairly uh, typical simple timber frame is two two twenty wide uh, stud. Um, there's there's nothing um, uh, fancy or special about it. Um, it's it's then fully insulated on the on the outside as you as you will see as well as in between the uh, the, the stud work. Um, beauty of the timber frame once it did eventually arrive, it, it was really quick to to put up. Of course, but. Um, the challenge was that we'd waited for so long for that detailed design that we, we probably lost the uh, the program advantage on the on the timber frame in the end. Um, but yeah, it went up very quickly, um, uh, and then of course we had to wait in the windows. So exposed site again, we were we were always challenged with the the weather, but the guys did the best they they, they could to uh, try and close it in as as as, as early as they could and, and protect it. Um, and then that was uh, insulated on the on the outside with a, a Kingspan rigid uh, insulation again, just to minimise the uh, the thermal bridges uh, through the through the timber frame, particularly where where we had um, you know fairly chunky timber uh, cripple studs and things going going up through. So just make sure we we had that hundred mil uh, all the way around the uh, the outside. Um, and then the insulation was uh, wrapped in a, a membrane and, and battened out. And uh, this is our, our kind of faceless building, which we had for a while while we uh, waited for the uh, windows to arrive. So they, 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 they wrapped it and then cut the holes back uh, in, the, in the membrane for the, the windows when, when they eventually uh, arrived. And there you can see the, the windows uh, uh, going in. And then eventually that was uh, clad in uh, Siberian larch um, well, for, for, for the most part with uh, some fibre cement board on the, uh, uh, on the lower parts of the uh, elevation. The, uh, the roof, um, perhaps another challenge. So we, we had a, a roof which uh, um, I guess was a hybrid roof. Uh, where we had the, the timber structure and that was infilled with cellulose and then, uh, you know, a, a layer of insulation on top of that a PVC membrane and then a, a green roof on top. Um, but when the, the roofing contractor was there, um, you got very nervous about the um, the hybrid roof nature. So we ended up having to do a full woofy analysis, uh, which it passed, uh, thankfully. Um, but that's probably meant at, at the time all of this was happening, uh, we were in a bad weather uh, space. 
and we were faced with that decision of, of leaving the roof open or getting it closed in. So we, at the end, we, we opted to uh, build up the insulation on the, on the roof to uh, effectively uh, uh, turn it into a warm roof if we, if we had to, uh, so that we could still get the, the overall U value uh, in, in case the, um, the Wi-Fi analysis didn't, didn't come back uh, uh, to, to support what we, what we had. So we've ended up with a roof that's probably performing way better than it actually needs to. And, and again, that's just a lesson learned for, for, for me, uh, uh, probably to steer, steer well clear of uh, hybrid roofs. Um, the, the windows are from Internorm, so they're, they're not a uh, certified product, but a, a very uh, high performing uh, product. Um, it's a kind of timber with a, an insulated uh, layer and then the uh, aluminium on the, uh, on the outside. Um, so it's their uh, HF310 product, um, uh, glazing's uh, 0.5 U-value uh, uh, tri triple glaze. Um, and they're uh, in and then taped back to the uh, membrane uh, with exoseal on the uh, on the sill to make sure that that was well protected and, and robust. And then uh, uh, I think it was a kind of take a tape around the uh, around the rest of the uh, of the frame. Uh, we've got one roof light, uh, which uh, is a Facro uh, product. It's actually because the roof's only about 15 degrees, um, we, we couldn't norm use a normal uh, uh, kind of Velux type window. So it's it's actually a flat roof window which you can install up to 15 degrees uh, and that's a quadruple uh, glazed um, uh, window um, uh, pass first certified uh, element and then internally uh, so the, the the stud work is uh, uh, we, we've got the intello membrane on, on the inside uh, battened and, and counter battened uh, taped with uh, tesco and vana um, and around the windows um, and then uh, pumped full of uh, cellulose. Uh, again, uh, Roman and the team at uh, Clio uh, uh, did all of that. I think this was the, the, the big nervous piece for us. The, the air tightness um, hadn't been through it before. Uh, the team hadn't really been through it before. We were aware of some uh, elements in the timber frame construction, which, which we were a bit concerned about. But, um, you know, to be, to be fair, Roman kind of uh, eased, our, uh, eased our concerns and, uh, and, and, and made it all work. So looking at some of the data, um, the uh, floor uh, is, is, the U values uh, are, the floor is, is 0.11, uh, walls 0.1, uh, roof 0.07, so you can see you probably way, uh, way over and above what it, what it really uh, needed to be. Um, windows average is 0.77 and then the roof window is 1.16 uh, installed. Um, but I guess we, we always knew we had to make up uh, a little bit for the amount of glazing we had. Um, so we, we'd already kind of committed to you know a, a better a better U value for the floor um, and the walls than than the normal kind of point point one five starting point. But the uh, yeah the roof kind of was a was a, a consequence of of that during construction kind of issue that we had to deal with. Air tightness, we, we ended up doing three tests. So we'd specified two tests, um, uh, but the, the contractor decided he, he wanted an extra one just for, for peace of mind. So the, the first one, which was really in completion of the airtight layer uh, was uh, 0.47. So, you know, fantastic first result. We were absolutely over the moon with that. Um, and then the next one uh, went even, even, even better again at, at 0.32. Um, now this was before the uh, the stove was installed, and we'll come back to that. That'll be another uh, point of, point of contention in, in pacifier circles. But that was before the stove was installed, and then on completion it was 0.39. Um, interestingly, just after that air tightness test, we did find uh, um, a slice in in one of the air tightness tapes, um, which obviously hadn't been bad enough to affect the air tightness results. So it would be interesting, you know, perhaps to run another one now to see just what the impact of, of, of that was and, and, you know, how, how far it would uh, uh, bring it back to maybe that second second value. But um, at the end of the day, it sits well beyond the 0.6 where we, we needed to be and, and we were all incredibly uh, happy with that. But what would we do differently? So I, I think Certainly, the insulation. Uh, I guess I'm I'm in a, a, in a different place now about uh, uh, materials, so I'd, I'd want to be using natural materials uh, wherever uh, possible. And we did think about changing it, you know, during construction and and um, 
uh, pulled back because it was just too big a too big a change at that point. Uh, the roof construction we've talked about certainly, um, you know, really uh, focusing on that much earlier on. Uh, more focus on program. I mean, the build has been uh, through everything from delays due to suppliers like the timber frame. Uh, delays due to COVID, we've had everything, delays due to Brexit, all of these things have kind of uh, really impacted on, on the speed of the build and also some of the sequencing, which is, has made it quite quite difficult, but, you know, it's we, we had to react to it. We, we couldn't really have foreseen, um, certainly most of it, we could have foreseen some of it, perhaps. Um, I, I, I always say it's worth considering non-certified windows because, you know, I think uh, with the with the right building, they, they can perform. You obviously need to do a little bit more work, but um, uh, worth worth considering. Um, and uh, certainly more focus on the window area and balance. So to, to get those stats that we showed at the start, um, maybe into a slightly better better position uh, where we could just have, you know, eased down on some of the windows if we'd um, really been paying uh, attention to that. Um, moving on to the, the mechanical systems. So we've, we've got a, a Zender uh, unit. Um, uh, ninety percent efficiency and you know, pretty pretty low energy uh, use, and that was uh, supplied through Paul Heat Recovery Scotland. Um, uh, Ross, our architect, had worked with them previously, so it was it was comfortable with that. And we had the three D modelling of of both the system, and we were able to kind of check that against the timber frame and make sure that uh, as everything was going up, we would uh, fit all of this in quite um, quite tight and, and congested in, in some of the areas, getting through some of the beams. So that was a useful useful exercise at the time. Um, the, the wider m the heat is, is provided um, by a, a very small heat pump, I think it's about a 4.3 kilowatt um, heat, heat pump, uh, Hitachi unit, um, and that, uh, uh, that heats uh, domestic hot water in a, in a tank, and then there's a buffer tank. Uh, and the heat supplied uh, through uh, tile radiators in the in the bathrooms, and then one one radiator in our in our hallway, which is kind of on the well, it's in the centre of the house, but certainly north uh, on the north side of the house. And then we 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 have a stove. We've debated it all the way along, but I think my my rationale for the stove was that you know with the exposed location we we live in and an overhead electricity supply. Um, there was always the risk that in the winter we we might be without power and uh, to be without power and uh, heat just seemed a, a step too far. Then there's the kind of cultural um, aspects of of having a having a fire. Um, but we we went for a more so stove which um, uh, meets the, the the DBIT German standard in terms of its um, uh, I suppose air tightness and and its suitability for airtight houses. Uh, and then a, a Pujolat uh, efficient um, uh, triple wall flue, so the the air is drawn uh, down the flue uh, when the when the stove's uh, lit. Um, but you know, certainly we don't use it very much. Um, it's kind of our quick heat up if we've if we've been out for a while or or we've, we've been away for a couple of days, um, or if it's a really cold spell. That's that's when we tend to tend to use it. But it's it's not used very much at all, and and probably backs up the argument for for not having it at all. Um, PV we we don't have at the moment, but we've been working with um, a guy called Tim Cooper uh, to really analyze the um, the energy use throughout the day um, and then size the system. So we've we've kind of got a proposal sitting to to add that um, to the house. At the minute, the uh, the building is um, EPC rating uh, B in Northern Ireland, but the the addition of the PV will bring that up to uh, an A rating. Um, not that that's overly important to us, but um, it, it, um, uh, certainly the PV aspect uh, is, and that's something we, we probably wanted to do earlier, but for budgetary reasons, we, we held off just to uh, see where we, where, we, where we were at the end of the build. Um, so m and &E, what would we do differently? Um, I think I'd probably fit wastewater heat recovery. I think that's, again, it's something that was very new back uh, when we started the journey, but recently um, it, it seems to be, uh, very popular and very effective, and uh, so we'd, we'd probably uh, do do that. Uh, in terms of the radiators, uh, we'd probably increase the area a little bit to allow them to run at a slightly lower temperature. They're, they're probably running a little bit higher than, um, the, than would be ideal to get the, the best efficiency out of them, but then, you know, at the end of the day, we don't need a lot, so um, it, it would be marginal gains. Um, we, we, we didn't actually employ a domestic M&E consultant uh, or a specialist at the time. Um, mainly because we couldn't really find or or, or 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 be put in touch with one but i would certainly recommend that is just someone to bring all of these systems uh, together 
Um, we did have the whole debate about spiral duct versus radial uh, ventilation uh, ducts, and I, I guess that's one which um, you know time will 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 tell. It's a, a little niggle at the back of my head that we we should have went with steel spiral ducts, but it would have been quite tricky, I think, in in our design to. Um, uh, to really make that work, I guess it's you know highlights the importance of if you're going to use that system, making sure that it's it's uh, front and center as you're as you're designing from the from the start. Um, some small things like uh, mounting of the internal heat pump unit, we see we're getting a bit of vibration with that, so the guys are are investigating that to try and sort that out. But um, you know it's just little things that because the the house is so quiet, um, you really pick up on. You know, little noises or or vibration noises, and um, that you might not otherwise pick up in, in a normal in a normal house. Um, and stove, I think we would really consider that next time. Uh, not that there will be a next time, but um, of course PV from the the start. Um, so talking a little bit about summer comfort, so we, we haven't actually implemented the shading strategy yet. At the at the time we we tendered and and all that, it it, it was uh, we saw it as a landscape element, so that's something that we're we're taking on ourselves and uh, the PHPP currently is based on uh, removable shade sails to the, the south. Um, but we've been kind of just watching what the weather has been like, what the wind has been like. And I think we're, we're probably going to have to just change that approach because we're, we're still getting some pretty strong wind, even at this time of time of year. Um, and we're probably going to go to, you know, some freestanding uh, pergola type shading uh, uh, along the south facade and then trying to um optimize that with the views because trying not to block the views with lots of columns um but uh, get the get the shading so at the minute we we don't have a shading strategy uh, in place and that's something that we're, we're working on over the summer um we do have some existing trees just on the boundary which are, are actually really quite effective um and we're also looking at some new tree planting to, to help with that but that's obviously a longer a longer term uh, solution um we do have bypass on the ventilation and that that certainly kicked in about uh, three weeks ago um, and, and that certainly seems to be uh, working in that we're, we're, we're not really breaking the, the 25 uh, uh, degree um, uh, kind of barrier but we're probably a bit closer to it than, than I would like to be at this point in the, in, in the year. Um, we do have lots of openable windows so the roof window is, is openable so we can kind of get stack venting out and, and overnight cooling and that's that's really effective. Uh, and again, we've got sliding doors to the living space, which uh, allows for cross ventilation. So, you know, we, we can purge heat fairly, fairly quickly uh, uh, in the event that we get uh, sunny spells up here in Northern Ireland, which is, is, is quite rare, but we've, we've had a good run now for the last couple of weeks. Um, we are beginning to monitor. Uh, so we're, we're logging weekly power consumption at the meter. Uh, we've got temperature sensors in various rooms. So they're also measuring uh, humidity. Uh, we're planning to monitor heat pump performance separately, you know, what, you know, the electricity in and heat out, but just trying to find a, a system to do that. Um, really happy to talk to anybody who's already got one. Um, and again, we, once we fit the PV, we'll, we'll be monitoring the, the performance of, of that when installed as well. Um, but I suppose some, some data uh, wouldn't be a pacifist presentation without some data. So this is this is where we are at the moment based on power at the meter. Um, so, you know, December, January, it was uh, about a thousand kilowatts, just over a thousand kilowatts for, for both of those months and then dropping down to, to 800. And it's kind of hovering around that sort of 750 to, to 800 um, as, as we've been going along. Now, this is based on us, um, you know, it's all working from, from home with, um, you know, IT kit running running all day, which um, wouldn't wouldn't normally be running in the house if we were if we were off in the studio. Um, but it's certainly performing on 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 target, and it looks to be um, in line with uh, with what we expected. Um, indoor temperatures. Um, uh, sorry, by my, I've got lots of uh, data, but when I was trying to pull it together, I think some of the sensors have dropped out every now and again, and um, I couldn't amalgamate it all into a sensible kind of graph. So I've, I've just kind of taken the um, the, the actual thermostat uh, temperature, but you you can kind of see it's it's running uh, probably from about 19 and a half to uh, 22 ish is, is where it's been running. I think in, in the early stages we 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 it took us a bit of time to find a position for the thermostat that that worked uh, in in the house because we've quite a lot of uh, 
uh, glazing so we were finding that it was spiking if the sun hit it and then if, if you put it in a really cold space then the, it was so we, we had to kind of work on what the right set point and what the right uh, position for that was but i think we've we've got that uh, uh, kind of sorted uh, sorted now um and then i thought this was was interesting i'm just kind of conscious of time but we're we're, we're nearly there um so we, we had these Natatmo sensors uh, actually in our previous house. So the green line re represents the point where we moved. Um, and certainly humidity in, in that uh, fairly typical semi-detached 10-year-old Northern Ireland house, um, the humidity was always running, you know, between, well, you can see there probably 45 and, and 70, uh, which, uh, you know, I think is probably on the high side and, and um, that's showing the summer months when, when we actually had uh, you know the windows open uh, most of the uh, most of the evening and most of the day as well so um, and then you can kind of see the difference the scale on the on the graphs to the right uh, changes and we're we're typically seeing you know between 35 and, and, and 50 in the, um, in the in the passive house um, I thought I actually thought I'd lost the old data but I find find it uh, the other day so it was, it was kind of useful comparison. And again, in, in CO2, you can see in the in the previous house, particularly in the bedrooms, you know, peaking at uh, you know above 900 for the the master and and, and 850 for Noah's, and then you can see in the past house, uh, apart from uh, some discrepancies at, at the start, but there there was a while where where we just moved in, the house wasn't fully decorated where where we were uh, we were all kind of sharing sharing the one space, which is why Noah's uh, is peaked higher at the start, but you can see where it's settled down. And, and really the, the CO2 level very rarely is, is getting above, um, you know, 600, 650 in the, in the past house. So it's a, a you know, significant uh, difference. Um, and then back in February, we, we uh, uh, joined the past house challenge where uh, the objective was to turn the heating off and see if we could survive a, a week. Um, and, and we were a bit nervous about this because we'd had the, the, the heating running since we moved in. and. Um, we, we weren't really sure, uh, you, you know, how, how well it would, uh, how well it would do. Uh, you know, we knew in theory it should do really well, but uh, putting it into practice is, is always another thing. Um, but you know, we 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 started off on on that week. We ended up lasting, I think, twelve days without without heating. Um, I think it was the last three days. We just had that really grey, dull weather, which uh, in the winter time is is a bit of a challenge for for passive house where you you don't get the solar gain and the temperature dropped to. I think it dropped to seventeen, so certainly not uh, certainly not uh, drastic, but enough to be uh, un uncomfortable when we were. Uh, sitting down to movie night so that's the point that the heating went back on but you can kind of see that um, the heating uh, or, the, or the, the average temperature was was fairly kind of static and I think it shows the resilience so you know maybe our argument for the power cut in the stove was uh, was unfounded really because the, the past house has, has kind of kept us warm for 12 days without uh, any any problem um, and that was February uh, and, and actually that the, when we did the past house challenge it was compared to maybe a month before that, it was a it was a, a milder spell, but um, certainly since then, you know, through to April, this is what we were waking up to. So, very, some very late snowfall up here uh, in April this year. Um, so that's um, pretty pretty much uh, me. Um, some uh, shots of where it is. I haven't taken wide shots of the house yet because as a landscape architect, we haven't finished the landscape. I'm not happy to take uh, take the wider photographs just yet, apart from this one from the uh, the lane. But um, certainly follow us on Twitter if you if you want to know more. We are going to try and just continue to monitor, document, and and, and share uh, our our findings uh, as we as we live in this um, you know fabulous place. That's me, thank you. I'll stop sharing. Okay, yeah, I think I'm back. Can everyone hear me? I think so. Um, th thank you, Simon. Um, a really, really um, impressive site and, and the house as well, and, and just taking us right through that journey and, and on to as well. So some initial performance data is, is really comprehensive um, and it really does take us back to what what I was trying to allude to at the start, um, you know, passive house delivers is as simple as that, really. Um, and, and there we are. So we're going to try and um, have some brief q and I am conscious of time. We're very keen to, to have this a short, sharp event around the hour. So, so maybe we'll, we'll just open the floor for a direct question if somebody wants to come in with one. 
Um, whoever's in first gets the question. Don't be shy. Nobody got a question. Um, there was some answer during the... I have one there. Thank that. you. All right. Yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering what, this, what Simon is the predicted heat load. So, um, yeah, it was uh, nine, uh, nine uh, watts per meter, John, is, is what the, uh, uh, the, the version uh, uh, that I looked at last, last night is they were, we're just going, going through and making sure that we've picked up any um, updates that happened during construction or any tweaks, but that's, that's where it's sitting at the moment, yeah. Excellent, very good. Thank you. Very good. For, for the un uninitiative or uninitiated, sorry, um, Simon, you showed a slide with a lot of stats on it uh, early on in your presentation, and uh, I'm not familiar with all the acronyms that were in there. Uh, is there any possibility you could uh, explain some of them? Ah, uh, right. Okay. Let me see if I can uh, uh, just go back to. So that that was the, the pacify stats slide. Yep. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, so we had, uh, so I suppose acronym uh, TFA was one, so that's treated floor area. So that's the the area of the of the building. And there's um, so things like habitable rooms. Um, you know, you take one hundred percent of the area, um, and then you know there are some uh, instances like if there's reduced head height or if it's a plant room where you only take a, a percentage of that. So it's it bit, bit in basic terms glazing, glazing to glazing area to floor area, uh, but it's it's not just as simple as full floor area. Um, then the other one was probably PER, which is, is primary energy renewable. Um, so, so that's the, um, the amount of energy that the house is going to use for both um, space heating, but also all of your anticipated um, plug loads uh, and energy use in, in the building. So, you know, fridge uh, cooking, you know, your, uh, your ventilation, your heating system, all of those kinds of things coming, coming together. Um, and on a on a a, a, a passive house dwelling, that's relatively straightforward. But obviously, when you get into larger buildings, that becomes quite quite a complex uh, calculation. But then there's a there's an overall energy target um, that the uh, the building has to hit, and for passive house, that's sixty kilowatt hours per meter squared of your t uh, your treated floor area per annum, um, and that's uh, that's your overall target that you're you're trying to meet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Um, so I think we're at the point now where we'll just break out into the breakout rooms. I noticed there's some questions there. I, I'm, I'm going to get them answered in the chat, hopefully between the breakout rooms and the end of the session as well. So um, I think around the table, particularly the PHI people, I think we'll be able to answer those quite easily. Um, but I think we're going to hand over to Vaughan now, who's just going to break us out into rooms, hopefully. Um, so if we can pull the trigger. Yes, I'm going to just do it now. Thanks, Barry. No problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Simon. Are we in a breakout room here? I'm not sure. I didn't. I, I didn't think we were, but maybe we are. Um, um, I think we are. Oh, I'm not wrecking this. <laughs> that was really good. Really, really good. Congrats. It's well, thanks, John. Yeah, no, it's, uh... yeah, and the I think the double volume space you have up to your study, uh, it, it's um, it adds such comfort. I yeah. think having large air volumes rather than small cellular rooms trying to rely on, you know, little 10 mil gaps under doors to allow air movement, uh, it really helps, I'd say, does it? it yeah, it, it, it does. And I think, I think particularly with, you know, because we've got fantastic west views and that's, that's probably yeah. our challenging, there's a lot yeah. of glazing there and that's probably yeah. our biggest challenge. Now, we're, we're very lucky. We've got a beautiful hawthorn tree, which is doing a fantastic job of, yeah. of, of cutting some of that late evening sun. But I think we... Yeah. 
but certainly that yeah having that big space which comes up to the study and then up to the roof window we can we can open a door down there open the roof window and it just purges the that's, heat out and that's, you know, it, that's it, it. Works really well. that's all you need isn't it because yeah. the uh, don't whatever you do don't be encouraged to putting films solar films no glass. no uh, uh, we've seen that go um, we've been monitoring some one place where they did that and it's a nightmare yeah i, th I think that the, the the challenge is kind of alluded to because we've got these views it's trying to um you, you know get the shading dealt with in a really kind of low-key you know yeah. without impacting the view and it's um uh, i think we just felt we had to be here we had to live we had to experience where where the sun was and yeah, yeah. where where the hot the hot spots were and then and then address it that way you can always poke a hole in the wall if you need to <laughs> and you know put an insulated vent down at low level or something because yeah. having that roof life is invaluable really yeah 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 so have you're you, in you've, um, sorry john yeah sorry go on shane no do, have you found that the heat rises and into the bedrooms uh you're, you're there just now I suppose during the summer and you get the feel for what's happening yeah i mean i, I think the, the the two bedrooms at the east are, are are pretty good and certainly in the winter they would they would tend to stay a bit cooler uh which is which is good um they they're they're not too bad in the summer i mean they they're they're warm in the morning when you wake up which is lovely um and then they they gradually the, the sun very quickly moves off those um those those two rooms uh, and they cool down during the day i think the 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 bedroom uh, uh which probably warms the most is, is Noah's, which is on that south south facade and and above the yeah the living space um, or certainly the snug space below so it's probably the one that um um you know we 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 see getting the warmest um at the moment and um again there's a there's a big there is a big window there uh probably could have done with being slightly smaller but again we've, we've no shading on it at the moment so that's 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 something we'll be we'll be looking at yeah they get a feel for one of the, the houses that was managed from in the early days had a um uh, an atrium and uh the the master bedroom which is just at the top you know received heat and again was back to whether they were shading um on, on the on the southerly um aspect well, yeah, I suppose these are things you got to feel for in terms of how the house actually performs when you're there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think the the two bedrooms. So one of them, uh, you know, has a has a door right onto a deck, and the the upper one has a door right onto the little balcony. So uh, again, you can just open the door, and uh, the, you get really good airflow through for half an hour, and you know, it's yeah. it's, it's, it's 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 yeah. fine, yeah. What is the size of the house, Simon? I missed the TFA. Uh, so, so, yeah, sorry, I, did, I actually didn't put the TFA on. It, it's um, 254, um, so a bit, a bit higher than we would have. We were we were aiming for. Well, we were aiming in the in the briefing stage for for sort of 200, and and then for various reasons it it, it crept up a little bit. And um, you know, and on one you know one aspect, I kind of look at that from you know efficiency and, and then you look at you know what the, the germans would say and there's only three of us in the house and it just feels as though it's it's probably excessive but at the same time none of the spaces feel excessive you know it feels they feel well proportioned um you know we've got space for when you know when we're entertaining which we you know we we intend to do so uh, you know i think it i don't think it's excessive but certainly it, it, it probably uh, could have been a little bit uh, tighter here and there what are you doing there? Your dream home. It looks fantastic. Well, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Com compared to you know the, the I think that when we bought the site, it had uh, planning for about four hundred and fifty square meters, and the, the house adjacent to us, I think, is six hundred and fifty. So you know that that certainly does feel excessive. <laughs> what trees did you plant? So um, we we uh, it's, it's a really nice mixture. We we've got uh, rowan, quite a lot of birch in it, alder. Mm -hmm. um, typically, there'd be a lot of ash around here, but we we couldn't plant ash uh, because of the uh, the disease. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a little bit of cherry, a bit of pine, uh, some oak in it as well. So it's it's a real nice mixture. Um, we we'd originally the original plan was to. Uh, just do a lot of coppice and then use that in the stove um, mm. and, and use that to heat the building. But um, we we kind of changed tack on that. And, mm. uh, yeah, I realised that that wasn't the way forward, really, was it? So uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, not the first one. On the but it's it's because yeah. it, we we've we've been in a bit of a journey, I suppose, with heating the building because. Um, 
uh, as we know, they need so little heat that um, when you begin to look at you know, heat pumps in the systems, certainly when we started looking at them, uh, the costs seemed disproportionate. Uh, and then you look at, um, you know, at that time, an efficient oil boiler, you could put that in and it, it's, uh, you know, relatively straightforward. Um, and, uh, you know, but again, I think it's, it's, it's for, for me, it's, or for us, it's the wider, wider discussion about, you know, how we should be uh, generating, generating our heat. And of course, the grid's a lot cleaner now than it was even, um, mm. you know, yeah, I think three or three or four years ago. Your PV array, what are, what are you looking at for that sign? Any of you yet? Uh, oh, uh, in what way? In terms of in terms of size, and will you, will you in terms suppose? of size, um, I, I, oh yeah, it, it's in, it's in around four kilowatts because I think there's a there's a limit, isn't there, on uh, um, yeah. on on what you yeah. can connect, or certainly there is here on what you can connect to the grid. So I think it was in and around four kilowatts. Um, Tim has has given me a a really detailed report, which I haven't really had a chance to fully digest, but he's, um, you know, worked out the, the, the cost benefit of adding batteries or adding an extra few panels or, or whatever. So, yeah, yeah. Or the car, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and we have an aspiration to, you know, have a, uh, a, an electric car at some point in the future. But again, it's, uh, uh, we're just kind of wait, waiting to see with that. So I, I think that the recommendation was to just go for a, a four kilowatt system and then probably try and uh, pump um, any sort of surplus into the uh, the domestic hot water uh, in the in the short term and then explore batteries further down the line yeah mm -hmm. yeah sounds good yeah we've got a very good uh, air test must be very pleased with that uh, absolutely over the moon, John, because yeah. uh, it was the one thing we were really concerned about the whole way through. And, you know, because, yeah. and, and, you know, as, as a client and past first consultant, every time I come onto site, I was made sure everybody was aware and, and mainly just to make sure that if anybody did damage it, they told us, you know, I'd, I'd, you know, if it gets damaged, that's fine. As long as we know about it, we can sort it. But, um, yeah, 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 no, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, <clears throat> I'm sure you know uh, uh, Roman um, mm. and, you know, he's, um, he was very good. He, he was yeah. 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 yeah, 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 makes such a difference. Yeah. Okay, so it's mm -hmm. it's back to me. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed or embraced the the breakout rooms. I I, I had quite a comical moment where uh, I I was in a room with one of my own team, uh, which was great, uh, and I asked them to join the call. So uh, familiarity was there. Um, I, ho I hope you enjoyed it as well. Yeah. So, Terrific. So, yeah, yeah, it was to us. Um, so re really just to, in, in terms of the last few things, just to round out on here, um, it, it's now the job for me to sort of maybe highlight something that's coming up uh, in addition to what we're doing here in terms of the series. And, and Simon's going to tell us about what's up next um, in terms of the next event and maybe the one after as well. But uh, re really what I want to bring the attention to everybody that uh, took the time to attend tonight and also maybe watching the recording later on is, is an event that's on next Tuesday. And it's with our own uh, board member, Jeff Colley of Passive House Plus magazine. Um, and it's, it's uh, titled uh, Passive House Thermal Breaks. It's, it's, it's a series event as well. Uh, and it's at 11 a.m. in the morning. And the topic of it is freedom of architectural expression versus building physics. So for anybody who's attending this, that is probably going to be right up your alley. So, uh, yeah, I'd encourage you to attend that. The Another wee snippet, just in addition to that, is also maybe watch out for those who don't know about it. Uh, I referred to earlier on at the start there that we're an affiliate with the International Passive House Association. And one of the campaigns that they're running for this year is, is hashtag uh, efficiency first. So, so just watch out for that across the various social medias. Um, or if you haven't heard of it or seen it yet, um, by all means, been look it up um, on the International Passive House Association website. And, and that, that's an interesting theme going on as well. So uh, I'll, I'll revert next week with or at the next event with more sort of snippets like that. But for now, I'll hand over to Simon, who's going to tell us what's up next uh, in, in, in the series. Hey, thanks, Barry. Uh... Yeah, so um, I'm not on mute. I'm, no, I'm not. Good. Um, so next uh, fortnight, so that'll be on the 17th of June, um, we've got uh, John Moorhead 
um, again, a, a, you know, a veteran of, of Passive House in, in Ireland, and he's going to be taking us through uh, a review, perhaps of Passive House performance in a temperate coastal climate. So 10 years of uh, his experience and learning. So I think we're, we're all really looking forward to, uh, to, to that. Um, and then uh, the following event after that, so two weeks uh, beyond that on the 1st of July, um, Barry's going to be uh, taking us through uh, the Erin Campus, the Future of Education, and I think uh, many of us will be uh, really interested to hear about, about this. And I think, um, you know, a, a different scale of Passive House, and I think looking at, at this building, you can you can see it doesn't, uh, it, it's, it's not the typical Passive House form. So uh, I'm sure there's uh, lots of things that uh, we can uh, uh, learn and hear from uh, on that building. So look forward to, to that as well. Uh, so that's uh, the next two events. Very good, Simon. Um, so that's really us, uh, just round now to close. Uh, we've done really well. We're on the hour, would you believe, uh, minute, minute to minute. So uh, well done to the team. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending and look forward to seeing you at the next event. And if you're watching the recording, uh, please enjoy and watch the previous ones. OK, good night. Uh, we'll wave you off. <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night. Barry and Simon, we might hang on, Ray, and we'll leave on. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 I have a question for you, Simon, while people are logging off. The, the U value installed of your roof light is 1.14 or something? Yeah, one point. Uh, that, that was actually the PHPP. Um, yeah. Oh. Um, I think the free, the frame is, I think the frame is about 1.1. Okay. And the, the glazing is 0.8. Um, I, yeah, I, I must admit when I when I when I looked at it last night, is that right? Um, but mm. uh, I, I will I will go and check it. But that, that's what was uh, certainly in the PHPP, and that's a it's a certified unit, so it would have been taking it off the database. But yeah. um, it's, it's probably know, some, the... some, sometimes in the database you can pick something that you think is is right, and it might you know there might be two entries on slightly different products. So I will I will check it. But yeah, I, I, I had a double tech at it myself. But um, see the frame the frame proportion is probably quite large because it's a yeah. small window. Yeah, yeah, yeah.